Hey there, Wolfpack fans. It's me again, Kenta Gibbs, bringing you another episode of Locked On Wolfpack. And folks, we're talking Pac-9 because after some very disappointing ball to start off the season, after what seemed like a, a an ACC series win drought that, you know, we didn't know when it was going to end, but boy, did they end it in spectacular fashion against the Louisville Cardinals. And we've got some midweek baseball for you as the errors continue to plague us. Grayson, you ready to get into it? I'm ready. We're getting into the, the meat of the baseball schedule. So we got a lot of good baseball to discuss here. Absolutely. It is time to talk some ACC baseball with an ACC baseball guy. We have got all that you could want on today's episode of Locked On Wolfpack. You are locked on NC State. Your daily podcast on the NC State Wolfpack. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Oh, happy days. Oh, happy days. When the pack won. No, but seriously, we, we got ourselves our first series win of the season against an ACC opponent. And it, it really did feel like, man, did, when is this day going to come? And it came in spectacular fashion again against one of the best teams in the nation. Grayson, take us through it. Get us into what happened during this series. It was a big one, to say the very least. You know, we welcomed number 11 Louisville into Raleigh this past weekend, and it was a series where one way or another we had to make something happen. With the, the first couple of ACC series, you know, we've lost uh, each time on Friday night and then managed to basically squander uh, an opportunity to take the rest of this series uh, in games two or three. But uh, we reversed our fortune with Louisville in town, and it started with Friday night. We were able to steal. I think that's an appropriate way to describe Friday's win. We were able to steal a win from Louisville, and we won for the first time in an ACC series uh, on Friday night. And so immediately we kind of set the tone for uh, the series in that it, it just, it felt different from the first inning on Friday night. Logan Whitaker was a Friday night starter as he has been uh, all year. And he was awesome. He went seven innings. He scattered four hits, only gave up one run, one walk, and he had seven strikeouts. This was far and away his best performance of the year so far. And what a spot to do it. What a what a gigantic opportunity that he seized against Louisville. And, you know, people kind of get bogged down in uh, Louisville's early ACC schedule. Don't be deceived. They are a very good team. We, uh, we took advantage of what they gave us, but they're a very good team. They're ranked number 11 uh, for a reason. But, you know, Friday night, we stole a win. We were leading for much of the game by a score of 2-1. to one. Right. Uh, we were able to take advantage early by an error in the bottom of the first committed by Louisville. Chase Nixon had another humongous hit. You're going to hear me talk about him a couple more times in this episode. Uh, but we we jumped out to a 2-0 lead. Louisville got one back later on in the fifth. So it was 2-1 for essentially the whole game here. And enter the bullpen. And obviously this is not a uh, a new gripe that I've had. And uh, surprisingly enough, my gripe this time came in the form of Sam Highfill. And this was surprising because he has been one of our more reliable arms out of the bullpen, even though there is kind of the elephant in the room in that we don't know if he should be in the bullpen because he, he, in my opinion, he probably should be a starter. But however you may see it, he's been coming out of the bullpen and he's been reliable. Right. Well, in game one, uh, it was quite the opposite, to, to, to be very nice about it. Uh, Sam Highfield, we turned the ball over to him. We're winning 2-1. to one. His first four batters, he goes double, single, hit by pitch, and then with the bases loaded, he walks in a run to tie it. And you're like, oh boy, is it coming again? Are we going to suffer another brutal loss again? Louisville goes up uh, 3-2 by an RBI fielder's choice. And then Sam Highfield gives up a two-out, two-RBI double, a complete backbreaker. So Louisville goes up 5-2. Uh, 
This is in the eighth inning, mind you. So this is right. late in the game. Feels like it could be a dagger. Um, you know, I I was actually I was at the game on Friday, so you could hear a lot of moaning and groaning about, oh boy, here it comes again. Well, we kind of went back to work. Parker Nolan chipped in a solo home run in the bottom of the eighth to give us a little bit more breathing room to get within two. And, you know, fast forwarding to bottom nine, Louisville imploded. And we took full advantage of that. They put two runners on uh, with one out. Will Marcy walked. And then Eli Serrano hit a little cheap ground ball to the pitcher. And he slips. uh, And everyone's safe. That was extremely lucky. And this is off of Louisville's closer. His last name is Kaner. He had an ERA coming into this game of .90. So he gives up virtually nothing. Well, Mm -hmm. he gave up enough to blow the game uh, here in game one. Parker Nolan walks. So now we have the bases loaded with one out. Uh, Kalei Harrison comes up with the bases loaded. He draws three balls, and then they change pitchers. This is a personal, humongous, um, can't think of the word at the moment, but I hate, hate when managers do this. I ca- I cannot I cannot stand when uh, managers take out a pitcher in the middle of a count. But Louisville did this. Uh, they they brought in a new pitcher to face Clay Harrison. I think it was a three one count. Ends up walking him. So now we have uh, <clears throat> now we have the score of five to four. Run comes in, and here comes our hero, our Lord and Savior, Gino Gruber. Knocks in the winning two runs, and we steal, quite literally, a win from Louisville uh, Friday night, game one. And like I mentioned, this set the tone for the series. We felt right away, okay, maybe this will be different this weekend. We we had momentum. We lost momentum. We took it back, and we were able to steal a win. And, uh, you know, I don't want to ramble on too long, but this spilled into game two. And I really don't have a whole lot to say about game two because – Point blank, we crushed them. We won 10 nothing. The offense was spectacular. The The defense, I have nothing but good things to say in this game. The Listen, that, that game was so wild. When they were giving the updates, I'm like, oh, this is an April Fool's joke. This, right. is, this is like somebody's pulling my chain here because it was April 1st. And I'm thinking to myself, ah, okay, somebody's playing a funny here because I'm like, we have seen this team be good this year, but we have not seen this team completely and utterly dominate ACC teams in this in the manner that game two went, where everything was working. I mean, everything, the communication in the outfield, the, the hitting was working, the base running, because we've had some base running errors this year that are complete and total head scratchers. This was a game where I'm sitting there and I'm like, man, this is amazing. We're doing the thing. I love to see this. So, you know, I proceed. I just... Nothing much to say about that game other than great things all around. No, it's a good point. And I've mentioned this a few times, but it's kind of been hit or miss on seeing this team at its full potential. I think one of the other times we've seen it is when we smoked Miami on the road. And other than just a couple times, you haven't seen things when all when it's all systems go. Yeah. Uh, well, that was the case in game two. Obviously, we won 10 nothing. The offense was great in big spots. The situational hitting was excellent. Like I just mentioned, the pitching was great. Matt Willison went six innings, only gave up two hits, no runs, three walks, and four strikeouts. And then behind him came Justin Lawson, who kind of got an extended save. It was a three-inning save, which is kind of rare. Um, but he also gave up virtually nothing. And we we completely stifled Louisville. They had nothing for us all day, and it was great. So now here you have NC State. Now they've won their first ACC series. And, you know, you got to keep in mind, this is against Louisville. This is one of the top teams in the ACC. And so it's like, this is exactly the kind of series that we had to have. And it's kind of, it's hard to go from a high back down to a low, but we we did drop game three. We could not complete the sweep. Um, but game three was... That was a game where it feels like uh, so far in the ACC series, 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 mm-hmm. Ser- series. Yeah. we, we, we seem to have one, usually just one game where we just can't get anything going. Yeah. And Louisville is a bit of a rare situation in which I believe they throw their best pitcher on a Sunday. And I guess in situations like this, it can, it can prevent getting swept. 
uh, and probably a lot of times for them, it can result in taking the series. So they throw their ace on Sunday, and he looked like an ace because we could not figure him out. So yeah. Louisville won by a score of 6-1 to one on Sunday. Um, not a whole lot to talk about again. Dom Fritton on the mound for us. Freshman, he took his first loss. I don't think he pitched very bad. Um, I thought he was effective. He just just made a couple mistakes in the form of solo home runs, and that was really all Louisville needed to have. Uh, they scored a couple more on a, a shortstop error. But, again, when you don't score, you can't win. So right. that, that basically wrapped up the Louisville series. It was a great series to have. Again, Louisville is one of the best teams in the ACC. And like you mentioned, the nation. They were 11, number 11 in the country. So that's a big-time win to defend the Doke. And it was a win that we desperately needed to have, a series win. Uh, so that was great to see. And before we move on here, or take a break, I guess, I do want to highlight uh, the Meet the Pack NIL situation they had after Game 3. I thought that was an excellent idea by all involved. Um, because, you know, with NIL so far, the main focus has been on football and basketball. And while I completely understand that, because those are your money getters mm -hmm. uh, here at NC State, it was good to see an event for baseball because you can you can see the the connection they're trying to make with the community in you know the autograph signings, the pitcher taking, the the auctioning off of cool memorabilia. They had a Trey Turner bat they were giving away. Uh, I think they had a Trey Turner cleats as well. Uh, some some players were giving away batting gloves. It was cool to see the involvement uh, and what you know all the possibilities you have with NIL. It's not just hey. XYZ player, come to us. We'll pay you a lot of money. There's a lot more behind the scenes in the form of connecting with the community and that sort of thing. And so that was a very cool thing to see on Sunday. Uh, it looked like a great success for all involved. I'm sure the players kind of appreciated that as well. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe so much as the, the players that don't get a whole lot of playing time, they're still getting to sign autographs and take the pictures. And, you know, they have their own little booth set up so everybody knows who they are. It was great. It was a great idea, and it was good to see it. So, with that being said, we can uh, we can take a break real, real quick here. I mean, and I at the end of the day, you know, making the quote unquote other guys, including them in moments like that, is vital because at the end of the day, nine times out of ten, especially in baseball, those other guys go on to become your big time players later on down the road. It's rare. The reason that Tommy Tanks was such a a huge success is because it's rare to see freshmen come in and do that. Normally you see, oh, okay, freshman year they show flashes. They get a home run here and there. They show the power, but you see very bad, poor plate discipline or just being god-awful defensively and you, you can't do anything with them but be a DH. And then they kind of get better. And they're like, okay, the plate discipline is increasing. Okay, they're starting to get better. They're starting to understand and communicate better on, in terms of uh, where the wall needs to go and, and all that good stuff. And then they start to hit that next level year three or four where the game starts to slow down. But at the end of the day, keeping those young guys included, very important. Keeping the guys who aren't as known, very important. And again, that's how great programs are built and, and all that good stuff. If you look at all of the best uh, programs in terms of your Vanderbilts of the world, your Wake Forest of the world, your all that, the, the guys who are nobody's coming up, they include them in everything, including things like the NIL deal. So that's just my idea there. And speaking of Built, I've got to talk to you all about Built Bar. Folks, Built Bar March Madness may be over, but Built Bar is still here and it's still great. Don't worry, folks. They'll be announcing soon uh, which folks have won a, a free box of Built Bar as well as the lucky customer who is going to get a 12-month subscription of Built for free. And I hope that you voted in Built March Madness because if you didn't, you missed out on your chance to get it. But trust me, even if you missed out on the chance to get it for free, it's worth every penny. You got to try Built. It's the best protein bar ever. And they're so amazing, you won't think they're good for you. These things have amazing macros and they're covered in 100% real chocolate. That is absolutely crazy to think about. But somehow those, those crazy scientists in the lab cooking up Built Bar have done it. So go to built.com right now to get your built bars. Um, again, if you don't want to do that, they're available in Walmart and Sam's Clubs near you. Trust me, they're worth it. You got to try them. Go to built.com to get your box today. 
All right, so Grayson, you said the game three, Louisville sent out their ace. We couldn't hit anything. And, and you know, like you said, you're not going to do anything well if you can't score. But then, in classic fashion of this team at other points this season, coming up against ECU, again, there are no favors. There are no breaks. There is no slowing down in this NC State schedule. You go from number 11 to number 12, and here's the fun part. Number two's on the other end of that. And I'm not talking about a dump, folks. I'm talking about the number two team in America. So talk to me about what happened in this ECU game tonight because, again, they could not score. Bats were not active Sunday, but, boy, were everybody's today. Talk to us about it. Yeah, I mean, we are right in the middle of an absolute gauntlet of a schedule. And right off the heels of a a big-time series win in Louisville, you got to go on the road in the middle of the week and face a very good East Carolina team in Greenville. And, you know, not to not to pump their tires at all, but they're a program that's been substantial for quite some time. You know, they were outs away from making it back to Omaha this year. I think they will be a team this year to watch for and possibly making it to Omaha for the first time. And it's it's tough with these midweek games uh, you know, occasionally, because does this game matter as much as our upcam- upcoming series against Wake Forest? In the grand scheme of things, no, it doesn't. But it's still great to have uh, on the resume. I mean, with also, you know, we swept ECU last year, and maybe that was not even enough to get us the nod into the tournament. But mm-hmm. regardless, this is a 12th ranked team on the road in the middle of the week. And it's it. I guess it was a tough task to be sandwiched in between two very good ACC teams, and but we came out and we were super aggressive mm. offensively. I think maybe overly aggressive in the first mm. couple innings. Um, we were taking two and three pitch at bats. It was just real quick. Couldn't get anything done, and it felt like we just tried to do too much too soon. Right. And once the third and fourth innings rolled around in this East Carolina game, we had better uh, better quality at bats. We were seeing more pitches, fouling pitches off, making their starter work, and it paid off. We settled down. We ended up taking a 2-1 lead, uh, but that is where the bulk of this conversation is about to go. And there was a humongous mental error committed, um, and I guess a physical error too, if you will, by Carter Trice in left field. This was in the fourth inning. And a lot of people jumped on jumped on the back of Peyton Green saying he should have caught this shallow fly ball. And 10 out of 10 times, probably, yes, Peyton Green should have caught that high fly ball. And it was not very far into the outfield. But this is what I, this is the point I want to make here. While that probably is Peyton Green's ball to catch with two outs, the moment an outfielder calls off an infielder, it is now the outfielder's responsibility. Whatever happens from there is on the outfielder. So Peyton Green's backpedaling. He hears Carter Trice call him off. He gets out of the way like he's supposed to. Now, Carter Trice, I think he is the one that misjudged this ball he ran way further than an outfielder should ever have to run in and wasn't able to make the catch. ECU scores on this blunder. They tie up the game at two. I believe the next batter after this singles in the right field. So ECU then takes the lead three, two, and then kind of the hinges come off, uh, or at least momentarily they blast a three run home run um, into the right field jungle. And it's just like, oh my gosh, what have we just done? We just let one small error be converted into five runs. And, you know, we've been talking about this a bunch on here. And I've said this many times. The smallest of mental errors will snowball on you so quickly. And this was probably the best example we've gotten of that so far this season. One drop fly ball immediately turned into five runs. And all of a sudden, you're down 6-2 to ECU on the road. 
But let's now, let's backtrack this a little bit because I think that this is a domino effect situation. Yes. When you you know you talk about snowballing, and let's talk about this from a standpoint of like you and I both play our respective sports at a high level. When you don't trust when there have been mistakes made and you struggle to brush off those mistakes and say, Hey, it happens. You know, guys do their thing. It's all right. You then try to overextend and do things that you probably shouldn't. That's where hero ball gets involved. That's where that I got it and running way further than you should get involved because there's a lack of trust amongst you and your teammates to some extent there to say like, If I wave this, if I let him have this, am I comfortable with him having this? If I have an All-American at shortstop or third base, am I okay with saying, eh, I trust you. You got it. As opposed to some of the defensive areas that we've seen already at that shortstop position this year, which makes you think, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying that this excuses it. I'm saying this is probably part of that thought process in that, all right, that ball is in the air. Yeah, yeah, I should probably let this go, but I think I can get to. Uh, I think I can get it. And I'm not. I'm no baseball expert. I am not. I will be the first person to tell you that. But I know for a fact that when you say I got it, you better have it. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, as far as the trust goes, maybe. I mean, it could have something to do with it. My personal opinion is, I just think Carter tries mid misread it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was. He was expecting it to be deeper than it, it turned out to be. And, I mean, I don't think it was a situation where the wind was blowing it in or anything like that. I I truly just think he misread it um, because, I mean, Wolfpack fans will probably go back and watch the replay a bunch of times. If you go back and look at it, the shortstop has to have that ball like 29 out of 10 times. Like, the, no excuse that should always be caught. In terms of where it landed, that should always be caught by the shortstop. Right. But like I said, the you know the way they we coach defense in baseball, the pop up priority. Anytime the outfielder says I got it over an infielder, the infielder is is taught to get out of the way, and that's what Peyton did. But I I mean Carter wasn't able to come up with it, and it killed us. It absolutely killed us. So a mistake you might think it's small, but like I said, just immediately ballooned into five runs, and it killed us. And how many out, that was with two outs, or and I, it was with two outs. So I want to I want to point this out too. If that ball is caught, the score remains two to one, and we go into uh, the top of the fifth. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I think it's pretty simple. I think it's pretty simple. We're seeing errors be the other. It's not a lack of talent. It's not a lack of. It's it's not necessarily being snake bitten because we're seeing when we. Err- as we must and as we should in terms of literally just following game plans. I'm not saying, hey, we, we lack the power to get it over the fence or we lack the speed to make something happen in base running or or defensively in the uh, outfit. It's not that. It seems to be that a lack of mental focus is the problem. We'll cover a little bit more of this thing before we land it here in just a second. So with this being said, we're we're seeing more and more errors, okay? And some Wolfpack fans, and and this is this used to be a loud minority, but it's becoming even after the Louisville game or the Louisville series, rather after tonight's game, there is a larger, growing number of people saying, "What is Avent coaching with that?" Are you in that group that's looking up like, "All right, defensively, what we're doing here is like." This isn't bad. This has at times been atrocious. What do we have going on here, Avon? Are you like, eh, it's okay. It's still early season. We're figuring our way through this thing. Uh, I'm probably right in the middle of those two lanes there. In terms of coaching, I mean, Avent has been doing this his entire life. He's on the brink of securing, I think it's what, 1,000 wins here at NC State. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's anything he's teaching incorrectly. Um, I, I do think it's just mental lapses. Um, I think it's just a little bit lack of focus, a little bit lack of execution. Um, that's kind of all it is there. In, in terms of having the guys in the right place at the right time, there's no excuse for that humongous error that occurred uh, behind Peyton Green at shortstop. 
Absolutely. That that has to be caught every single time. So that's not an avent thing. Um, that's just that's just a mental error thing. So I I mean I, I definitely see the gripes. Uh it's all over Twitter. It's all over, you know, I'm sure uh anywhere you look in the message boards, people are chirping about it, but it's not anything that's being taught incorrectly, I believe. I, I have enough trust in Avent and the coaching staff that all that kind of the basics have been covered and Again, guys at the D1 level, they've known this as long as they've been playing baseball virtually. So I just think it was a big mental error. But, I mean, it cost us. At at least at that point in time, um, we were able to tie and then retake the lead uh, in the fifth inning, kind of a hit parade type situation. We we had seven straight singles. We scored uh, five runs to take the lead back. But the other snake that's been biting us, so we've had the defensive snake, we also have the pitching slash bullpen snake. Well, mm-hmm. that snake paid us a visit right after we took the lead back. Uh, we relinquished the lead in the bottom uh, bottom of the seventh. Jacob Jenkins Cowart. Uh, that's that's a lot of names to say, but he had three home runs tonight, and he was their best player, and he looked like it. He he yeah. tied the game up at seven, bottom five, and then we kind of went quiet after that. Uh, ECU scored three more in the bottom of the six with another JJC. I'm not saying his whole name again. JJC home run. Um, ECU ended up hitting two more home runs to to make it a 13-7 game. And then we scored two more in the uh, the top of the ninth off of a two-run home run by Parker Nolan. But at that point, it's too little too late. And again, the bullpen slash defense snakes, they both bit us. And that was the story of the ball game. It was extremely winnable. Would have been a great win to have, not just resume wise, but also in state rival wise. Yeah, but uh, it's tough when you when you beat yourself. It's hard to win a game. So yeah. I know I sounded like Trent Dilfer there. <laughs> you can't win if you lose or whatever he said. But I mean, but you're, you're not beat wrong. ourselves. You're not, and yeah, yeah. When well, you're a recurring theme, so, you're playing. You're already playing an opponent. You're already playing yeah. an opponent. You don't need to add yourself to that. You do not, you never need to add yourself to that. And like you've talked about, you know what I mean? There's, there's again, it's not a lack of talent. It's no. not, our guys aren't throwing 70 tops and it's like, hey, this is what we got. You know what I mean? We got what we got and we live with it. This is, again, the, the mental lapses in key moments. Because these aren't just mental lapses that just happen randomly throughout the game. With two outs in that moment, we're we're holding a two one lead. You can help us take that. You know, it's it's just a uh, again. Maybe you're right. Maybe it has nothing to do with a lack of trust. Maybe it is just a misreading of it. But at some point in time, at some point in time, the rubber has to meet the road, and there can be no more excuses. There can be no more. Well, we don't know what it is. At the at the end of the day, we don't care about the labor pains. We want to see a beautiful bouncing baby. And that's the reality. That's how this we sports is a result based business. We as podcasters work in a result based business. It is not about, oh, well, how thoughtful was your commentary? It's about did you get eyeballs on the screen? Did you get people to sit down and listen? And with the with the team here, with all of our teams, it's about except for golf. Did you score more points than the other team? That's what this thing comes down to. And too often, we're hanging our heads and saying, we were right there. We were so close. We were right on the precipice. There's a lot of season left. So again, if the base, if the resident baseball guy ain't panicking, I ain't panicking. But, you know, good, good series win against Louisville. Again, opportunity for a massive series win this weekend. We'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. We we'll hope that there's no snake in our boot for these few. <laughs> right. The uh the series win against Louisville, that was the exact kind of win uh that we needed. And that's why I was pleading not to hit the panic button yet. Cause because I knew that a series win like that was a possibility. We went and got it. That was great. Now, this coming weekend in Wake Forest, they're ranked number two in the country. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know actually Elon just picked them off. Uh, Tuesday night, which was a surprise because Elon has now beaten Wake and NC State on the road. So I guess uh, props to Elon, but 
Make no mistake about it. Wake Forest is the best team in the ACC. They're likely going to play like it this weekend. And so we cannot afford any of these mental lapses, these quiet nights at the plate. It's going to have to be, like you said, rubber to the road this weekend. This is the biggest series of the year, I guess, up to this point. But I predict it's probably the biggest series of the whole season, uh, even moving forward. This is a big time show us what you're made of series. It is iron meets iron. We're going to see who comes out on top. Absolutely. Well, I couldn't have put it better. Thank you all so very much for showing up, Wolfpack Nation. Y'all make this show what it is every single time. Peace and love, y'all. As always, go Pack. Go Pack. You are locked on NC State. Your daily podcast on the NC State Wolfpack. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Thank you.